Well, welcome everyone. Um, if you can't see, uh, it's uh, welcome to move uh, closer. There's plenty of room up up front, so uh, thank you all for coming. And so I thought we might just start by uh, just closing our eyes. And you can let go of the day. And I'm going to invite you just to feel inward. Now simply to notice. Notice this gentle sense of aliveness. There's just a gentle sense of aliveness flowing through your body right now. There's nowhere to go, nothing to do. And I'm going to invite you to notice that this, this gentle sense of aliveness is good. That there's an innate goodness about you. You don't have to go to heaven. You don't have to go to church. But right here in the center of your chest. So you can take some deep, full belly breaths, just breathing, relaxing the body. And of course, if there's anything at all you're struggling with, I encourage you just to let that go, to give yourself permission, just to let go of any struggle. If there's any definition of yourself that you have, any critical nature that's reminding you that you're not good, <laughs> I encourage you to let go of that. And simply breathe and notice. That there's something quite innocent here. quite innocent. So often throughout our life we're harsh, we're judgmental, we're wanting this thing to be different and that thing to be different. But right here in this moment, the center of your heart, beyond any thought, beyond any emotion. is something that is naturally good. And so we can take a couple more deep, full breaths, relaxing the belly, relaxing the pelvis, the legs, the feet, the arms, the hands. And giving yourself full permission simply to notice this quiet sense of radiance, which you are, which you are. And with that, I'm going to invite you just to gently open your eyes. And as you feel into the room right now, 
can you notice just this, this gentle sense of peace that's right here, right now? There's nothing to struggle with in the room. We're just sitting here. And often, like a fish, a fish doesn't notice the water. You know, most of us humans, we don't notice that we're literally walking around in peace. We are walking around in what the Buddha called vastness, spaciousness. To use Christ's terms, he said, the kingdom of heaven is here about the earth, yet no man seeth. Right here, right now. We're just sitting in a quiet room at the Hilton Hotel. And we're sitting in peace. Sitting in peace. And so I'm going to invite you to inwardly smile and begin to notice that there's something beautiful here, right here, right now. Now, if you ask your mind, you know, all of us, we have these thinking minds, and our thinking minds are literally programmed. Programmed by life, by evolution, to look for problems. Like, that's what this kind of mind that we have. It's programmed to look for problems. So we're programmed to walk into a room, and instead of noticing a quiet, peaceful room, our mind is supposed to look for problems. You know, like, oh, I don't like this chair. I don't like the feeling in my back. I don't like this. I don't like that. You know, the Buddha called this the nature of the mind. And it's this kind of mind, it's very good if you're, you know, if you live with me out in Colorado and you're on a big, uh, a big hike in the mountains and you see a mountain lion, it's good to have a mind that looks for problems and that says, oh, look, <laughs> I better get away from that cat before I get eaten. That's an appropriate time to have that kind of mind. Now, if we were living in Syria right now and bombs were raining down upon us, it would be wonderful for you to have a mind that's looking for problems. But on a Saturday afternoon, It's not so helpful to be engaged with a mind that can be critical, whether it's attacking. You know, sometimes our mind, it doesn't attack. It doesn't look for problems in the outward environment. It looks inward and tries to find problems with our own nature. And so imagine that walking around and having a mind that's telling you you're not good enough, you're not beautiful, you're not innocent, you're too old, too big, too small. You don't look like the model on the magazine cover, whatever it is. And so the invitation here is to let go of that kind of mind, to let go of the internal critic, and to be like a child inside, where you're connected with your innocence, your innate radiance and goodness. You know, I think somewhere it said, you are made in the image and likeness of God. Isn't that what the Bible says? We are made in the image and likeness of God. And oftentimes people, they, they, mis they misinterpret that. And they think, okay, God must have a body like us or something. But no, we are made with radiance, with innocence, with a big, loving, compassionate heart. Our mind is meant to be spacious and vast and empty, like the night sky. Our heart is meant to be open and to see the kingdom of heaven everywhere, everywhere. And so the good news is, is these are our innate qual qualities. These are our innate qualities. This is what we are made of. Now there's a great question that, that my teacher used to ask. 
who am I? Who am I if I walk into a room with no thought? Like, what are, what are you, fundamentally? If you walk in a room with no thought, and you simply experience yourself on the level of essence, not on the level of mind, because we all know what it feels like on the level of mind, right? Like if you've ever watched uh, cable news, which I'm sure you know most of you have, that's life on the level of mind. You know, two, three, four talking heads all just kind of arguing. You know, they're just lost in their opinions, and we've all been there before, just lost in our political opinions, our religious opinions, our spiritual opinions, our opinions about our family, about our sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, whatever it is. We've all been lost there. And that's, you know, the normal basic human condition. You know, like we were in a traffic jam about an hour ago, and we were driving down, and I noticed my mind just going, oh boy, <laughs> this is way too many people, because I, I come from a place with not so many people, and so my mind, it had this complaint that there was too many people. But see, as soon as we start complaining, we step out of the fundamental state of reality, which is spacious, which is free, which is open, which is loving. Now most people, they live their whole life you know, detached from the fundamental reality, but attached to you know, just regular human consciousness, which is kind of crazy. And when you live in this way, well, you create a world where we're shooting each other, bombing each other. You know, it's a little doggy dog out there. But when you choose instead to come into your heart and see the divinity looking out of your own eyes, your own eyes, when you can look into the mirror and see your beauty, This beautiful thing changes. Now we begin to see the beauty in others. Even if they drive us crazy, <laughs> you can still <laughs> see their divinity. You can still see their divinity. And so one of the things that I was supposed to talk about today, if I think back to the, the title of today's talk, it's called Strong Back, Open Heart. And this is a, it's an old Zen teaching. Uh, the, the way my teacher used to tell, tell me about this same teaching, he said, Craig, you need to have two things on the path. You need to have love and strength. Love and strength. And so if we look at, uh, say, the masculine side of divinity and then the feminine side, the masculine side is very much like the path of Buddhism. You have a very clear, awake mind that's empty, that's free. You focus on spaciousness, you focus on peace. You realize the simple sense of peace, which is right here in every moment. Every moment. And so this is what the Buddha, the Buddha taught. He said, I didn't want to wait for God. I didn't want to, you know, have to, you know, go to all these heaven worlds or this or that. I want to take full responsibility for my life right here, right now, and find peace within me. And so he just looked at his mind and he said, if I believe my thoughts, I tend to suffer because my thinking mind tends to complain. And so he created this whole realm of spirituality that's simply based on realizing yourself as peace, that the fundamental nature of, of your mind is, is peace. Now what most people think their mind is, it's, is one thought after the next thought, after the next thought, after the next thought. But if you step back you know, into a place of mindfulness and notice Instead of all the thoughts in your head, notice the space in which thoughts arise. The space in which thought arises. 
There is space here in every moment of our life. Every moment. If your mind wasn't inherently spacious right now, you couldn't have any thought come forward. There wouldn't be room for a, a critic or a, oh, I really like that or I don't like that. All these things are able to arise because your mind is inherently spacious. And so what the Buddha taught was, can we train ourselves to focus on the space that's here instead of focusing on all the thoughts that are here? Now, so this is, this is literally living in a way that's opposite of survival mind. It's opposite of the egoic mind, which is a, a fight or flight response toward life. You know, if you've ever sat down and talked politics with someone and disagreed, if you, you'll notice your body will immediately go into a fight or flight response. Fighters, fight or flight, literally. You'll say, I need to get the hell out of here, or I need to fight with this person and convince them why Donald Trump is the best or the worst person on planet Earth. And this is where our mind goes. It goes right into fight or flight. But what, and the Buddha said it very clearly, if you live in that way, you will suffer. So it's just like basic math. If you live in this way, you will suffer. Like if you hold on to old anger, you suffer. Now your mind may think, oh, if I remain angry at this person for the next 20 years of my life, <laughs> I'm protecting myself from their crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's what the human mind thinks. But when you hold on to anger the way the Buddha taught it is, it's like holding on to a hot coal. You burn. You burn. Come on in, sweetie. And so the invitation here is if you have a hot coal, is to do what's wise. That's what the Buddha taught. Do what's wise. Let it drop. Let it fall away. Let it fall away. And so this is the, the teachings of, of the Divine Masculine is to have a very clear mind. And so in order to have a clear mind, you have to do this funny thing. You have to not believe what you think. What you think. Don't believe what you think. And if you ever stand back in meditation and just simply look at thought, you'll notice your thoughts come they're not yours. They're just thoughts that arise. I was on vacation once. It was about uh, maybe 15 years ago with my aunt. And I had a, a little boy. And I was being a little too harsh with him. And there's this phrase that came out of my mouth. I can't remember exactly what it was, but my, my beautiful aunt said, that's exactly what my father said to me. And at the time, I was a little upset. I was like, well, I'm angry right now. You know, I'm angry. But it really it stayed with me for years. It was a thought I had never had before. And I said this, this particular phrase that her father said to her, a phrase that I had never heard in my life. And I stood back and I said, where the hell did that thought come from? Is it really my thought? Or does it belong to my lineage? You know, like my family <laughs> lineage. And there's that old saying, like the sins of your fathers, the ones that are unhealed, they're passed down to us. Well, the thoughts, the thoughts of your family members are literally passed down to you. They arise within your consciousness. And so this teaching on not believing our thoughts, it's good just to step back and look, are these thoughts actually even mine? Where do they come from? And so the way the Buddha taught it is, instead of being so interested and attached to your very thoughts, can you step back from your thoughts, which you think are yours, which we're not even sure they're ours. 
and choose to instead be more excited about stepping into the very space in which thought arises and notice what happens. What happens to your body energetically when you step into the space of your true nature, the space of innocence, the space of your consciousness? You become very quiet, you become very relaxed, your body immediately becomes at ease, you're breathing more deeply, you're not up here, you know, having arguments with people who aren't even in the room. You know, we've all done this before. We have an argument with a family member. Or sometimes it's with someone online. We don't even know who the hell the person is. We're arguing with them on Facebook. We may walk away four hours later and are still arguing. You know, the Buddha called this the dream state. It's like being in a dream arguing with someone who's, who doesn't exist. You know, doesn't exist like right here. <laughs> you know, they may exist somewhere. You know, I was reading this article that, that uh, some of the arguments that people are having, they think they're having them with, with other Americans, but they're having them with, with people in Russia who are paid to argue with Americans, you know, to create divisiveness in our country, which is like a whole other level of crazy. But but are we arguing and getting lost? Are we holding on to that hot goal? Or are we willing to drop it and to step back into this experience of peace? Into this experience of peace. You know, in the teachings of Jesus, when we forgive, when we forgive another, we benefit. So many people, I work as a, a counselor, and so many people say, Craig, I don't want to forgive this person because what they did was wrong. And I said, yes, I agree what they did was wrong, but when you forgive, you benefit. <laughs> you get to let go of it. You get to move on with your life. You get to end the suffering in yourself. But when you hold on to that anger or sadness or rage or jealousy or whatever it is, you suffer, and you're not really protecting. <laughs> you're not really protecting yourself from them through holding on to it and replaying it again and again and again. If you want to protect yourself, well, you may set a boundary. That's wise. And I work with with so many people. The, the, the one of the funniest stories I have is. A guy came into my office and he was so angry at his ex-wife and he was going on and on and on about how much he hated this woman. I said, oh, geez, that's, that's really, I'm so sorry you went through this. When did you guys get divorced? And he said, well, it was in 1980. And I was like, 1980, what? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? You got to be kidding me. <laughs> this, is, this is a long time ago. You, it's... We, we can't continue to be angry at our ex-wife when it was 1980. It's time to let go of that. It's time to let go. And so this is what it means to have a strong back. A strong back means we see clearly. See clearly. So outward, outwardly we see clearly. And by outwardly, you know, we look. We look, what is actually happening now? What's actually happening? Oh, someone is disagreeing with our politics. Okay. Can I breathe and not go into a fight or flight response? Can I listen? Can I try to communicate clearly? That's what's happening. So can I see clearly? Can I let go of that fight or flight response? Can I let go of the internal critic? You know, so part of seeing clearly is, can you look in the mirror at yourself and smile? Can you see your beauty, your innocence, your divinity? When Jesus said, I am the Son of God, he wasn't saying, I am the one and only Son, and no one else is, and everyone else is a heathen. 
Now that's the way, <laughs> you know, many of our churches interpret that for some unknown reason. He came here to teach that I am God. Like when you look inside and step into this presence, I am. And so that's what I was speaking about in the beginning. I am. That's our fundamental essence. I am God. I am the Son of God. I am the daughter of God. I am divine. I am. This is what was revolutionary about his teaching. He said, you don't need the damn rabbi. You don't need the intermediary. You don't need the priest. Now, for some reason, we've gotten so confused. <laughs> and I grew up with the Catholic Church, and everyone has all this pain and trauma around the Catholic Church. The way I've related to God is I walk in the church. I feel the presence of Christ. I feel the presence of love. I connect with that. The priest says something good, I say yes more. If he says something crazy, I just let it go. I don't know what he's talking about. And I don't know what he's talking about a lot of the time. The lamb of this, the yoke of that, the ox, the Corinthians, the Assyrians. I don't know what that's about. I don't care. I want to walk in and feel the presence of God and realize I, I am made in the image and likeness of God. My heart is good. That's what Jesus' teaching was. Look in the mirror and see you are God. So the strong back is, I see clearly. I'm not going to listen to my internal critic. I'm not going to listen to a priest that says I am bad because I wasn't baptized or whatever it was. I'm going to open my heart and connect directly with God. And if we get baptized, beautiful. It's a wonderful ceremony. It's beautiful. But if we're not baptized, <laughs> you know, we're not going to hell. It would seem like a crazy God to say if you're not baptized, you're going to burn in hell. That would be a crazy God. But we have to remember, open heart, God is love. Love. And so the invitation is, can you come into your heart and see that what you are is good? What you are is beautiful. What you are is divine. And if you cannot see that, then I will tell you clearly there is something wrong with you. And by that, by that, I mean, you're carrying around pain, pain from the past. When I looked in the mirror and saw that I was angry, there was something wrong with me. I was covered in anger. And so then we must look, well, how do we work with anger? So it's beautiful if we can be like the Buddha and say, oh, there's a hot coal in my hand. I need to drop it. And many of us have tried this. You know, many of us, I'm sure, have, in this room have read The Power of Now. And old Eckhart tells us, okay, come into the now, come into the peace, realize you know, the past is the past. Excuse me. But for many of us, that doesn't work. Many of us, the pain is deep. And so again, here's where we come back to the open heart. And if we look at just developmentally what humans need, like sometimes we need some more love to let go. Sometimes we need some of that divine feminine. Sometimes we need to call upon Mary and say, Mary, will you come into my heart? Will you hold me? Will you love me? Will you adore me? Will you help me to let go of this? Sometimes we need to grieve. But see, many, many individuals, I found, they carry around pain, and they try simply just 
you know, to let it go. Okay, the Buddha said, just let it go. And so they try to let it go, and then they, but it didn't go. And they read a, another spiritual book and says, get into the now. Say, okay, I'm in the now, but for some reason I'm, I have this anger and grumpiness that's floating around in my consciousness. I, I'm not letting go what's going on. And for so many of us, we need to have we need to be connected with a presence of love so that we first feel safe enough to let go. And so any way that we can come into a state of love, whether it's connecting with the Divine Mother, whether it's going and getting a massage or visiting a counselor or a teacher or visiting a, a church. For many of us, we need to find this love. First, first, so that we can let go. Now, I had a very difficult time with my father. We were just completely different individuals. And I had tremendous anger toward him for much of my life. And there was many times when I just knew, okay, I just have to let this go. I have to let this go. I have to let this go. But it wouldn't go. And so I had to look inside and say, what do I need? So I had to have this sense of compassion toward myself. What do I need so that I can forgive him? I need to feel safe. I need to feel like I have a right to belong here on planet Earth. Because one of the things he did is he frightened me at times. And when I was a, a little boy and sensitive, you know, when you get frightened, you think, I shouldn't be here on planet Earth. I shouldn't be in this body. I shouldn't be in this family. I shouldn't be wherever. And so what I did is I spent many years in meditation holding that little boy and letting him know, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to cry. <laughs> it's okay to be angry. It's okay to feel. It's okay to admit this hurt. It's okay. It's okay. And through nurturing that kid inside who got so beat up, A kid inside could grow up, could, could feel strong, could see my father and say, yes, okay, <laughs> you drive me a little crazy. But at this moment, I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to let go. And I'm going to know that it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And then the forgiveness starts to spontaneously unravel out of our bodies. And when you can forgive yourself, when you can see that what you are is good and worthy of being here, then you can start to look at another and say, you know, the reason the way they are, the way they are, is probably because they're in pain. It's probably because they're in pain. And this is true of anyone on planet Earth. It's like if anyone's mean to us, it's almost always because they are in pain. They're not just an inherently ruthlessly mean individual. It's normally just because they are in pain. And so if we do want life here on planet Earth to change, if we want to live in a way where it's not a fight or flight response, if it's not Democrats versus Republicans, you know, black versus white, good versus bad, whatever it is, Christians versus Muslims, all this silliness. If we want the world to change, we have to find a way to love ourselves, <coughs> let go of the past, and then actively choose to love each other. 
But the first step, the hardest step, which is hilarious, is the hardest step is for people to look inside and to see that, oh, I am good. <coughs> and I can love myself. I can forgive myself for being human. I can forgive others for being human. <laughs> But see, it takes courage. It takes the courage to look inward and to step back and to not believe your own thoughts. And of course, I'm only talking about the thoughts that are repetitive, habitual. You know the stories you keep telling yourself. <coughs> this shouldn't have happened. This person shouldn't have done that. I don't deserve that. And, and it's a good chance you did not deserve to be treated that way. You know, that may be true. But it did happen. And so then we have to look, well, what do I need? Do I need to just continually attack and hate this person for the rest of my life? Or do I need to help that little girl or little boy inside feel safe enough <coughs> to open her heart and to come out and play in this world again? And once you start to open your heart and play in the world, you begin to see that this world is divine. The kingdom of heaven is here about the earth, yet no man seeth. But then you get to start to see it. You begin to see the spaciousness. <coughs> you know, the other night I was driving down the highway And I felt like I was just in this big, spacious earth. And I saw all these red lights, you know, just swarming in one direction, and white lights swarming in this other. I just felt like I was in this divine river on the highway. I could have been up in my head like I was earlier today, saying, there's too many people here on planet Earth, and this is crazy, and creating all this pollution, and this and that. But instead, I was able just to see this divinity. to see this divinity. I would love it if you looked in the mirror and saw your beauty, your innocence, your divinity, to look in the mirror and to see Christ looking back at you through your own eyes. Isn't that a beautiful thing? to look in the mirror and to see Christ looking back at you. To see your innocence, to see your divinity. Instead of looking in the mirror and be like, oh, my hair doesn't look just right. I need to get it just right <laughs> before I get out. Or to play this game that so many people play. I'm too big, too small, too this, too that. I mean, you can live in that way, but it's just, a, it's just a recipe for suffering. And this is what the Buddha taught 2,500 years ago. Now, Christ just taught it in a little different way. The kingdom of heaven is within. So can you look inside and find this quiet presence of innocence? And so anyways, we have a little bit of time, so uh, I normally take questions. Does anyone have uh, any questions or anything they want to ask or share, or uh, you're welcome to correct me as well? Yes? I don't have a question. Um, mine's just more of a comment sure. about um, you know, how, we, how we actually come into ourselves and you know, being a, um, a product States or even the world or whatever, you know, I had a, a, a really hard time with a lot of things that had been going on. And in, um, on January 1st, me and my husband and two of my grandchildren, we made prayer ties. 
Yes. And uh, just to throw up in this little ceremony that we did, and it was very, very individual. And and my my goal for 2018 was to learn how to be able to love myself. Yes. And that was my project. I yes. loved the project. And by doing that, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing, but I had no idea what all that entailed. Yes. You know, and with the forgiveness and, you know, with the, um, you know, the judgments and all of those things. Sure. Um, you know, I, I too had to ask for help, you know, and, and I said, you know, to God, hey, you have to take this evil man for the day. I can't yeah. deal with her. She's nuts. She's yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, so I, I didn't have that. Yes. Know, and, and so when I would, would, would meet someone that, you know, was screaming their head off and going crazy, <coughs> it was like, okay, it's not the ego, it's the real life me. Yes. You know, now what am I going to do? You know? Yes. And it was a whole different energy once my energy changed. Yes, absolutely. No, that's 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 very beautiful, and I think that's it's so true for so many of us. As as we look inside, we realize there's all these things going on. You know, where do I start? And so, one of the things we can have, I always recommend a, a daily meditation practice, you know, a yoga practice, you know, uh, spending time in silence, prayer practice, spending time, you know in a church or in a spiritual group or with a teacher. So it's good to have support here on planet Earth. It's good to have support. And so what we find is, you know, almost every spiritual tradition will ask that you spend some time in silence each day. So no phone, no radio, no, no cable news. And can you just sit in silence? And what we find is, you know, a lot of people, uh, I've, I've spent, you know, a tremendous amount of time on retreat and in silence, but a lot of people, when they first sit in silence, what the, they, they first realize is how anxious they are. That there's like, you know, like all this anxiety that starts to come up. And they'll literally feel it in their throat, and it'll start to try to come up through the throat chakra, and then right away, you know, they'll say, where's that damn phone? Get me on Instagram. Get me... Get me busy doing something. I need to get to work. I need to. And what that anxiety really is, is, is if you just stop and sit with it, it's just like a little kid saying, hey, can you give me some attention? Can you give me some love? Can you listen to me? And we have to know how to listen. And so yesterday, you know, we were in a car ride way home from the zoo and my little girl was just you know just being yep 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 it's like non-stop and you know I was starting to feel a little crazy inside but a good question is what does she really need I mean what she really needed was to get out of the car <laughs> and run around and so you know you can't always do that but it's good to when I say listen is when the anxiety is talking to you oftentimes there's the surface thoughts which are I don't like this I don't like that person I don't like what happened but just like a, when you're listening to a little girl and it's 10 o'clock at night, she's screaming, I want a cookie, she doesn't really need the cookie. What she needs is someone to help self-soothe her, help her to calm down. And so when you have this anxiety come forward, it's good to look, not at the surface thought, because the surface thought is that, that dream state reality. Or, you know, it's cable news. We're all arguing about what we think is the truth. But can we deepen inside and say, what's really going on in me? Oh, I'm hurting. Okay, if I'm hurting, what do I need? I need to breathe deeply. I need to connect with a sense of love. I need to feel safe. That's what I really need. That's what I really need. And so it's a beautiful thing, you know, if you can c connect through prayer, if you can connect through meditation. You know, some people aren't very good at sitting meditation, and so they, they need to do a walking meditation. And so that's beautiful. 
just walk, just leave the phone at home. So we're not, you know, walking. It's funny, I see people walk and they're like, walk out in the middle of the street texting. I'm like, holy cow, this is, this is not good. Put that thing away. Put that away. You know, and walk. Connect with the bigness of the sky, the clouds, the spaciousness that's here. As you're walking, you're taking deep, full belly breaths. You're letting go of the, de the, the day, the week, the month. You're letting go of any argument you have with the kids or whatever is in the past. And you're just breathing, feeling, letting go. And then I'm going to invite you to notice after you spend a little bit of time just emptying out. Notice what's here. What's here? Can you notice that there is something good, something pure, right here in your heart? What is that? What is that quiet presence? What is that quiet divinity? And can you fall in love with that? By falling in love, I mean, can you place your attention there and keep it there? Keep it there. Because your other choices, you can go up in your head and have an argument with someone who's not present, or you know, plan out your work day, or go over your to-do list again and again, make sure you don't miss anything, that important business you're supposed to be doing. I used to, to build houses, and so I would have lumber lists in my head. I'd wake up at 2 in the morning thinking I need to get one, one more 2 by 12. But it'd be nice at 2 in the morning just to sleep, <laughs> to let go into you know, a deep state of consciousness beyond thought, and to let the body truly relax. You know, instead of wondering, oh, did I get enough two by twelves? You know, did I do I need to get one more? So, Chris, is fear different than anxiety? At the at the core level, it's the same. Yeah, at, it's it's the same. Yeah, yeah. But there's a there's a funny thing that happens with with fear is inherently wired into our body is is just a state of you know what I call existential fear. And so most people, are, they walk around with, this, with a state of existential fear and they don't even realize it. You know, it just kind of haunts them. And sometimes when we've had trauma in our life, we get stuck. You know, we get just stuck in like, you know, I call it like a low-grade scream. That's just silently in the background. And you'll find this, you know, like sometimes if you go up behind someone and touch them on the shoulder and they jump, and they're like, <laughs> just like, hey, you know, it's just me. It's, there's, no, there's no danger, you know. Remember, we're just all hanging out at the hotel. And so, so uh, the beautiful thing to do is, is to sit down and to really have a conversation with the fear. You know, again, like it's a little girl and say, hey, fear, like, what's going on with you? What's this about? And again, she'll tell you oftentimes a surface level answer. But then if you look deeper, you know, just wired in the human ego is a feeling the world is an unsafe place. And so then it's a, a good to ask, is that true? But especially if the feeling's very overwhelming, like fear, it doesn't. Um, you know, you can't really do logic with little kids. Like, little kids don't respond to logic. I mean, sometimes, you know, oh, there's nothing to fear, I can let go, and then all of a sudden you have this big, you know, cathartic release and you feel better. But oftentimes when it's, you know, when it's deep, like, in, like literally in our cellular memory, you have to sit with it, and there's normally, if, normally it's we need to grieve something. We need to grieve something. And so to make friends with fear, you have to love it. 
to say yes to it. Say, yes, what's going on with you? What's this like? What's this really about? Now, fear is a real fun one. For me, I can remember, I, I started to look at this fear in my body, and, I, and for about eight or nine months, I just had this raging existential fear. It was keeping me up at night. I was having panic attacks all throughout the day. And I started to open more and more and more to this. And I realized there was this old wound in me. It was, it was almost one that I just, just brought like right into this world. I didn't want to come to planet Earth. You know, like I didn't want to be here. Like I wanted to be in heaven with God. <laughs> I don't like this world. It's a little too rough. I did not want to be here. You know? And then, you know, I, of course, I had just like stacked all these layers of fear on top of it, whether it's my father, my ex wife, when, you know, getting beat up in middle school or whatever the hell it was, you know. There's pl there was plenty of those, but when I looked at the core of it, I felt literally abandoned by God. But as I started to open to that and really feel into it and nurture it and meet it with love, there, there became this real funny shift that fear actually turned into the excitement of being here on planet Earth. You know, fear is just like the flip side of excitement. And it was a, it was a wonderful thing. And so now, you know, when someone comes into my office and they're having a panic attack or whatever it is, I say, okay, good, let's sit with this, let's see what this is about. Let's open the door, because when you start facing it again and again, you develop this confidence that I'm not going to die if I open to fear. You know, another fun one is like rage or anger. Like, if I really open to this, I'm not going to shoot someone. <laughs> It's just a lot of energy. It's, it's actually a lot of power is what anger is. And it helps you to get your voice. And your voice isn't to yell at your neighbor and tell her why she's wrong. That's not the voice I'm talking about. It's being able to look inside and say, oh, maybe I was wrong. Or maybe they were confused. Or maybe we were both confused. Or, oh my God, isn't it fucking hard to be a human being? But to be able to stand in that power and say, yeah, life is fucking hard. But it's okay to keep loving, to keep opening, to keep forgiving, to keep saying yes, to keep trying instead of saying, life is hard and I need to go home and close down and turn on the news and be distracted about something that's crazier than me which is what you know, a lot of us are doing now. It's like, I want to be distracted by something crazier than me. Before we had reality TV, now we have reality news. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful question. And uh, I mean, the big thing with fear is, is do we love ourselves enough to take the time to investigate what the hell is actually happening within our own consciousness? You know, do we love ourselves enough? And so sitting with fear means we sit down, we breathe, we talk with it. And again, we talk with the depth of it, not the shallowness of it. The shallowness of it will say, run or fight, or this is too much. But the beautiful thing is, is that when you walk through the doorway of fear, you realize it's not too much. You realize is that what I am is great. What I am is big enough. You begin to, to discover your consciousness is Christ consciousness. It's big enough to face this. But the only way you realize that you are big enough to face something is through facing it. I mean, the only way to truly be like Christ, you have to be fearless. You have to walk into crazy situations and say, yes, yes. I'm not going to do fight or flight response, you know. Like Jesus, they put him on trial, and Pontius Pilate said, "Will you just lie a little bit and change your story, and then I won't have to do this. I don't want to have to do this. 
Jesus said, no, I want to stay in the truth. That's crazy. But to live in Christ consciousness is a crazy way of being. It's outside of the realm of the normal, everyday human. Normal, everyday human would be like, yeah, let me lie a little bit and get the hell out of this situation. That's, I'm going to save my butt. But he said, no, I don't want to lie. I want to live the truth. And this is what, you know, something like fear will force us to do is, it'll force us to look inside and see, what is this about? What am I actually made of? Is the fear greater than me or am I greater than the fear? But if we don't investigate it, it's always greater than us. And so, you know, I've spent many days laying on the floor, having panic attacks, feeling the fear, and just letting it roll through the body. Is it okay? <laughs> All right, I'm letting go. I'm still alive. You know, but sometimes, you know, people, they go into weird states in their mind. They have a panic attack. They say, oh, my God, I need to go to the ER. My friend works at the ER. He says, all day long, people come in for panic attacks. Think they're having heart, heart attacks. And, you know, of course, you know, it's good to get checked out, be safe, you know, do what's wise. But it's also good to be mindful and to know what is happening within you. This is just old pain that wants your attention. And what panic and anxiety and fear really is, again, it's just a little kid who wants your attention and it's trying to release. So the human body is not meant to be a stuffing ground of emotions, like a dumping ground where they're repressed. The throat chakra is meant to be open. And if you have a feeling, you know, like sadness, you're supposed to cry. Someone dies, you're supposed to cry. <laughs> Someone's mean, it's good to cry, <laughs> breathe, <laughs> let go. <laughs> And then it doesn't haunt you forever. Like if you ever see little kids, they have these raging fits. And then you just fall asleep, you know. That's how the human body is wired. But as adults, one of the things we do is we stuff, we repress, and then these things get stuck in us. And then we carry them around and then create these belief systems that I'm a no good, rotten person inside. Okay. So thank you all so much. It's probably time for me to be done. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, yeah, thank you. So. Thank you. Yeah.